Hi, I'm Pastor Christine, pastor at Mountain Grove Lutheran Parish in Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania, and this is our second video in our Bible study series, Consider the Birds. So this Bible study is based off of the book by Debbie Blue, uh, Consider the Birds. And in this video, we are going to be considering the quail. So last time we talked about the dove or the pigeon, either word is fine. Um, and I asked you to think about what comes to mind when you think of a dove, what comes to mind when you think of a pigeon? Well, when we had our in-person Bible study with the quail, I asked the group of people, what comes to mind when you think of quail? And it was silence. No one really said anything until finally someone spoke up and said, yum, yum. <laughs> and of course we all laughed at it, but really that's it, right? Quail are primarily considered for their food. Uh, that's their primary relationship with us. Um, and that's how it was in biblical times as well, as well. Quail were primarily there for meat. Now, before we get into our lessons for today, you see quail in two prominent stories in the Bible, one in Exodus, one in Numbers. Um, but before we really dive into those stories, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the quail that we're going to be studying. So most likely the quail of the Bible were probably called either common or old world quail. And the common quail is different from the North American quail that we have here in the United States. Because primarily our Northern quail, they kind of like to stay put. But the common old, old world quail, they're a migratory bird. And so what the quails would do is they would spend the summers up in Eastern or, and Central Europe have their babies, raise their babies. But then as winter came, they would then migrate down south, either to Sub-Saharan Africa or to Western India. Now, in the middle of that journey of their migration um, is the Mediterranean Sea. And the thing about quails, they struggle flying, right? They don't like to fly too much, it's one of the things that make them so tasty. They've got a lot of meat. They've got a lot of fat. And it's hard for their wings to carry them over long distances, especially without being able to land and take a break. So what the quail would do is when they got to the Mediterranean coast in Europe, they would wait for a favorable wind to come. And when a good, strong tailwind would come, that's when they would start and make the journey into the Egyptian coast, North Sinai, um, the Middle East, and they would make that journey. Now, it was a really long journey, and hopefully if the wind held out, they would have just enough energy to make it to the other shore. When they would land, however, they would be so tired that they couldn't move. They had to rest. And so there are stories of people being able to just go up and capture the quail where they land because they're too tired to even move from people. There is a first century um, Roman philosopher and naturalist. Uh, he was also a naval officer. And we have one of his books where he described this event. And he said that the quail would land in so great numbers and they would be so tired that they would land on the boats and sink them. They would overtake the boats. I also found a journal article um, from 2012 where they looked at how many quail were caught uh, during that season and they estimated that three million quail were caught in North Sinai and the Egyptian coast during their 45 day migration period. So you can see this migration thing, it happens every year. And that's probably the event that we're going to be hearing about in our Bible stories later. But the other thing with quail, 
um, is that some cultures, quail are seen as good luck and a symbol of protection. And in other cultures, they are deemed an ill omen and an accursed bird. So they really kind of have both sides going. And one of the reasons, or a suspected reason, um, is because of their diet. So quail are unique in that they are able to eat seeds from poisonous plants without suffering any ill effects. They can eat uh, the seeds from a hemlock tree without getting sick. The problem though, is that they think that the seeds can then taint the meat so that when people eat quail who have been nesting in a hemlock grove, they then suffer the ill effects. Um, and so there are reports of people eating quail and getting kidney disease, and if they eat too much, even death. Uh, and so that kind of plays into where quail can be seen as both a gift and a curse. And that's what we're going to be exploring in our Bible stories for today. Um, because both of our stories tell of the Israelites in the wilderness complaining about not enough meat. And God sends them quail. And while the stories are kind of have the same premise, the outcome of those two stories are very different. And so I just kind of... I want to compare and contrast uh, those two Bible stories for today. So we are going to start out with Exodus chapter 16. Uh, and this is a long one. It's verses 1 through 21. The whole congregation of the Israelites set out from Elam, and Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. Then, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way, I will test them, whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gathered on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening, and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke, to the whole congregation of the Israelites. They looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. 
Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather as much of it as each of you needs, an omer to a person according to the number of persons, all providing for those in their tents. The Israelites did so, some gathering more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, those who gathered much had nothing over, and those who gathered little had no shortage. They gathered as much as each of them needed. And Moses said to them, Let no one leave any of it over until morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and became foul. And Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning, they gathered it, as much as they needed. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. So, we have this story of the Israelites in the wilderness. Exodus chapter 16. It is taking place month and a half, six weeks or so, uh, after the Israelites leave Egypt and they cross the Red Sea. Chapter 15 is when we hear about the crossing of the Red Sea. So this seems kind of immediately after. And the Israelites are just in the beginning of their journey. And here we see as they complain, the quail, it's tied to God's gift of manna. Um, and so as the Israelites, they complain and God says, here, I will give you all that you need so that you know I am the Lord your God. And the quail kind of plays second fiddle to the manna. If you keep reading that, it says that the manna tasted like honey and the quail was fat. Um, but the quail, or but the story really focuses on manna. Now, one of the things um, that Debbie Blue suggests, or one of the commonalities that you see in our two stories is that the Israelites are complaining. They are all in the desert. They don't know where they're going. They don't know how long it's going to take. And they think back on what they had in Egypt. And as we so often do, they gloss over all the bad parts and remember the good parts. But as they complain and have this sort of memory that's not quite right, and they long to go back, Debbie Blue suggests that it is because the Israelites are accustomed to the Egyptian gods and to Pharaoh who do not take care of them. They're not used to a God who is going to care and lead them. They're used to being told what to do and receiving only the scraps for doing it. They're used to being taken advantage of instead of being loved. And so Debbie Blue suggests that the Israelites complaining, the murmuring, it comes from an inability from the, for the Israelites to trust God's love. They're just beginning this relationship with God and they don't necessarily know all that God's going to do or even the kind of God that God is going to be. All they have is their memory of Egypt with a Pharaoh and gods that did not care for them. And so the fear then comes from not knowing that they can trust God to provide. And God then responds extravagantly with this. Um, rather than getting really mad, we see Aaron and Moses get a little upset, but not so much from God in this story. Instead, God gives them quail, God gives them the manna, and as I said before, it's described as the quail being really fat and juicy, and the manna tasting as crackers made with honey or wafers made with honey. And back then, honey was a luxury, right? Um, it was the sign of the good life if you could have honey in your food. 
Now we're going to go over to numbers. Um, and we're going to look at the number story in three different parts. So we're going to start with Numbers chapter 11, verses 4 to 15. The rabble among them had a strong craving, and the Israelites also wept again and said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we used to eat in Egypt for nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Now the manna was like coriander seed, and its color was like the color of gum resin. The people went around and gathered it, ground it in mills or beat it in mortars, then boiled it in pots and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was like the taste of cakes baked with oil. When the dew fell on the camp in the night, the manna would fall with it. Moses heard the people weeping through their families, all at the entrances of their tents. Then the Lord became very angry and Moses was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you treated your servants so badly? Why have I not found favor in your sight, that you lay the burden of all this people on me? Did I conceive all this people? Did I give birth to them, that you should say to me, Carry them in your bosom, as a nurse carries a sucking child, to the land that you promised on an oath to their ancestors? Where am I to get meat to give to all these people? For they come weeping to me and say, give us meat to eat. I am not able to carry this people alone, for they are too heavy for me. If this is the way you are going to treat me, put me to death at once. If I have found favor in your sight, and do not let me see my misery. So, that's the beginning of our story quite a different uh, way of describing things, right? And if you look at the beginning of Exodus and the beginning of Numbers, so our uh, story in Numbers takes place roughly a year later. Israelites, they are still in the wilderness, still wandering. But if you look at the descriptions or the differences in the descriptions, in Exodus, as the Israelites, they're still romanticizing their time back in Egypt. But they're talking about the flesh pots, which were the big pots in which they would boil and prepare the meat. Um, and that's kind of it. Fast forward to Numbers a year later, and they are talking about the melons and the cucumbers and the leeks and the garlic and the fish. All this amazing stuff that they had back in Egypt. Of course, the reality is, as slaves in Egypt, no, they probably weren't eating all of those amazing things. And yet that's how they're remembering it. And it's increasing the tension. And then if you look at Moses, Moses's reaction to this and the reaction of God, those are also very different, especially Moses. Before Moses was a little um, upset with the Israelites, you're complaining about God, God's doing this, don't complain to me. But that was kind of it. Now you've got this big multi-verse um, complaint that Moses is laying against God and it ends with him saying, Kill me now, because death would be better than what you have commanded me to do. So you've got those two very different strong reactions as well. And then finally, I want to look at the description of the manna. Because if you continue on in our story in Exodus, a little bit longer, it talks about the manna tasting of coriander, but tasting of crackers made with honey. 
Now we see, A, all the work that goes into it and the ways that they prepare it. And it tastes like bread made with oil. It's no longer sweet. It's no longer great. It is just plain old carbs. And so what you begin to see is the Israelites' perception of what God has given them has changed. And the responses and the complaining, you just get the sense that there's this anger and this tension underneath it all. We're going to continue on uh, with the story. Numbers 11 verses 16 to 23. So the Lord said to Moses, gather for me 70 of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tent of meeting and have them take their places there with you. I will come down and talk with you there. And I will take some of the spirit that is on you and put it on them. And they shall bear the burden of the people along with you, so that you will not bear it all by yourself. And say to the people, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, and you shall eat meat. For you have wailed in the hearing of the Lord, saying, If only we had meat to eat. Surely it was better for us in Egypt. Therefore, the Lord will give you meat to eat, and you shall eat it. You shall eat not only one day, or two days, or five days, or ten days, or twenty days, but for a whole month, until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you. Because you have rejected the Lord who is among you, and have wailed before him, saying, Why did we ever leave Egypt? But Moses said, The people I am with number 600,000 on foot, and you say I will give them meat that they may eat for a whole month? Are there enough flocks and herds to slaughter for them? Are there enough fish in the sea to catch for them? The Lord said to Moses, Is the Lord's power limited? Now you shall see whether my word will come true for you or not. So, we get a little bit of more of God's reaction, right? God's response to the Israelites complaining, as well as to Moses, is quite a bit different, right? It's still this sense that, yes, I will send you all of this quail so that you will know I am God. And yet, the intention behind it is very different. Um, I don't think I ever quite thought of eating so much quail that it would come out of their nostrils uh, would be a quote in the Bible. <laughs> but there it is. It's this sense that the Israelites crave so much, they're going to get it. So, different response from Moses different response from God. Um, a lot more anger. We will finish the story with Numbers 11 verses 31 to 35. Then a wind went out from the Lord, and it brought quails from the sea and let them fall beside the camp. About a day's journey on this side and a day's journey on the other side, all around the camp, about two cubits deep on the ground. So the people worked all that day and night, and all the next day gathering the quails. The least anyone gathered was ten homers, and they spread them out for themselves all around the camp. But while the meat was still between their teeth, before it was consumed, the anger of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord struck the people with a very great plague. So that place was called Kibroth Havata, because they buried the people who had the craving. From Kibroth Havata, the people journeyed to Hazaroth. 
that's a really hard lesson to read. Um, not necessarily one of the feel good lessons. I know in the in-person Bible study, when we read the Exodus story, that one was great and easy to read. And we had really good discussion about how God cares for us, even when we maybe don't deserve it. And then we got to this lesson and you just see everyone's shoulders kind of droop a little lower with the weight of what they heard. And it's a really hard lesson to grapple with. But I also think it's really important that we grapple with it because it is part of the Bible. We say that the word of God is present here. The word of God has something to tell us here. And so as we grapple with this story, I want to keep our attention. Um, I want to focus on the Israelites because uh, I don't know about you, but I kind of identify with the Israelites in this story, if I'm being honest. So the Israelites, they are often referred to as a stiff-necked people, meaning that they are unwielding, are unyielding. They cannot um, adapt well. They keep staying in that Egyptian mindset and unable to live fully as God's people. I hear the term stiff-necked, and I think back, um, there is a term that Martin Luther used to describe humanity. Uh, and he said that Martin Luther described uh, humanity as incurvatus and say. So we are curved in on ourselves. Our spines are curved so that we are navel gazers. We gaze at our belly buttons. We can't get out of that position. We are so self-centered and trained on my thoughts, my wants, my needs. And we can't get out of that. Just like the Israelites, we are stiff-necked, unable to live fully as God's people. But part of that then means that we crave for those things that are not good for us. We crave, we commit sin, right? We have these cravings for sin and sin, the wage of sin is ultimately death. And so the Israelites, they have this craving for quail that God gives them. And one of the ways I was looking at this, um, was with parents. Was there ever a time when you were raising your children that you knew they were making the wrong choice, you knew they were doing the wrong thing, and yet you let them do it? And when I asked that of our in-person Bible study, every single parent nodded their heads, yes. And when I asked them why, the general consensus was, that's how they learn. You don't learn if you don't make mistakes. And one of the things, it's an off, it's not necessarily a happy uh, fact, but a uh, fact thing, whatever. But pain is the biggest motivator for change. You burn your hand on the stove, you learn really quickly to be careful of the stove because it hurt. There's this rare disease known as congenital insensitivity to pain with anhydrosis. And it's a disease where people feel no pain at all. But one of the reasons why it's so rare is because people don't live very long with it. Most patients with that condition die by the time they're four. Occasionally they'll live longer but they're almost completely, they almost all of them pass away by the age of 25. And part of that is because pain tells you when your life is in danger. That's how you know you're in trouble. And so the Israelites, they have this craving, but they don't realize how much trouble they are in, how much it is, it is endangering them and preventing them from living the life that God wants. They keep going back to remember that time in Egypt, 
that time in Egypt, they weren't living as God's people. They were separated, cut off from God. And they remember that time. And they crave to go back to that time, even though that time leads ultimately to death. And that's where I think it becomes really important for us as we read this story to take hard looks at ourselves. What are those things that we crave that aren't actually good for us? What are the ways that we crave sin that lead us away from living the life that God wants for us? Because we can't pretend that they don't exist because we know they do. We are in bondage to sin and we cannot escape it. But it's also important that we recognize the ways that we sin. Because if we don't recognize them, it doesn't mean that they go away. They are there. We just don't recognize how they are controlling our lives. So when we don't recognize their, those cravings, when we pretend that our cravings are all noble and good things, they control our lives then in ways that we don't see or recognize or experience as hurtful. That truth, the hard look at ourselves, it becomes really important. It's why we have the confession and forgiveness every Sunday. Because every week, we crave that which would kill us. We sin. And we need that forgiveness. But also, we need to learn from the previous week. We know it's never going to be perfect. We know we can't achieve perfection. And yet that doesn't mean that we don't try. The Israelites, they called the place Kibroth Havata. It means literally graves of craving. When we refuse to recognize the ways that our cravings control our lives, that is where it ends up. As we look at these quail, they're hard stories. They're also good stories too, right? We had that wonderful story in Exodus in the beginning. And the quail is prominent in both. Both the hard as well as the good or the easy, the affirming. And I think then what we see is that the quail in the Bible, they are both a sign of God's extravagant care as well as a sign that the Israelites and ourselves our desires need transforming. God continues to care for us, and yet we're still stiff-necked navel gazers. But the thing about this, even though it feels like we're ending on a really heavy note, and we are, there's good news here. And the good news is that this isn't the end of the story. We're in numbers, right? Fourth book of the Bible. There's a lot more that happens. Even though God is really angry in this story, God doesn't break the covenant with the Israelites. They are still God's people. God continues to send them manna, whether it tastes like honey or oil, it is still there. And God still sends his son, Jesus, to do what we cannot, to help loosen up our necks, straighten out our spines, and help us to see just what it is we truly desire. What it means to truly desire a life lived in the kingdom. And so for that, I give thanks. <laughs>